The greatest achievement in sports is to be called a GOAT. I don't mean this kind of GOAT, though they're kind of fun too. I mean the greatest of all time. We all know our GOATs for the modern era of sports. Babe Ruth, Michael Jordan, Serena Williams, and more. They've defined their sports and won more times than we can count. For the modern Olympics, we don't have to go so far back. Michael Phelps is the person to win the most Olympic victories ever with his unprecedented 23 gold medals. For women, it is the Soviet Union's famous gymnast Larisa Latinina with nine gold medals. The epic swimmer Katie Ledecky might pass her this year in 2024, so stay tuned. Phelps was the first to beat an Olympic record that was held for over 2,000 years for the most wins ever by the runner Leonidas of Rhodes. Leonidas was famous in ancient Greece and Rome for winning 12 crowns over four different Olympics. Today, our statistics help us define and argue over who is a goat and who is a sheep. But statistics don't really capture all of what it meant to be a goat, either in the ancient world or in modern times. For one, our ancient statistics are scanty at best. We have an incomplete record of Olympic wins. Also in the ancient Olympics, there was no gold, silver, and bronze, no runner-up trophies. There was just one winner who was given a gift and crowned with olive leaves, a wreath of olive leaves, who stood beside a bunch of naked losers. Because yes, everybody was naked. And just as important as stats are the legends that grew up around our athletic heroes. How Wilt Chamberlain's dominance led to the rules of basketball changing forever, or Jesse Owens' phenomenal Olympic performance in Berlin in 1936, sticking it to Hitler and the Nazis, the cultural impact of our sports heroes. So out of those who performed in honor of Zeus at his sanctuary at Olympia for over a thousand years, and yes, the ancient Olympic Games went on for over a thousand years. So if we want to think about the greatest of all times, we need to also consider the greatest Olympians of ancient times, our mythical goats. Number three, Leonidas of Rhodes in running. Statistically, the greatest of all our goats has got to be Leonidas of Rhodes, the Usain Bolt of ancient Greece. Note, it's not this Leonidas. He's the king of Sparta. They lived hundreds of years apart. Leo was just a common name because people like to name their children after lions. Weirdly, we don't know much about Leonidas of Rhodes. This is doubly weird because he's also the latest goat we're going to be talking about. His victories came in the 154th through 157th Olympic Games, spanning 164 to 152 BC. This is firmly a historical period for the ancient Olympics, a period when we have more detail and fairly decent confidence in the accuracy of the historical record available to us. Unlike the earliest Olympics, where everything is shrouded in myth and we have conflicting accounts of who won, what happened, and when. Leonidas of Rhodes is certainly mentioned in many historical sources because he won the most important event of the ancient Olympics, the stadion a sprint that covered one length of the stadium at Olympia, about 190 meters. The winner of this event was automatically enshrined in the history books because it was how the ancient Greeks told historical time. To the ancient Greeks, there was no year one. Instead, most city-states kept time by noting who held a specific position in their city. So the Athenians would say that the Peloponnesian Wars in 431 BC began when Pythodorus was archon. But that doesn't help matters when Sparta is keeping time based on who the E4 was, someone named Dionysius. If we were to do this today, Americans would talk about everything that happened this year as occurring not in 2024, but in the fourth year of Biden's presidency, while the French would refer to it as the eighth year of Macron's presidency. And in the UK, 2022 would have been called the year of three prime ministers and an unwilted lettuce. But across the ancient Greek world, ancient historians and other scholars eventually coordinated their dates on who won the stadion sprint in the Olympics every four years, an event that everyone knew about. So Leonidas is certainly deserving of everlasting fame because his victories in the sprint at the Olympics marked time in the Greek world for 16 years. That's how you put your name in the history books. 
But he didn't just win this sprint. He won two other races, the Dialos and the Hoplito Dromos, a four-time Triple Crown winner. Note that he wasn't the first to win such a Triple Crown. Both Fanas of Pelini and Astilos of Syracuse had done so hundreds of years earlier. Second note, Astilos from Syracuse was also famous for switching nationalities, something that happens sometimes today. After he switched from Croton, his home city, to Syracuse, the people of Croton tore down his winning statue, much like this. But back to Leonidas. He was certainly famous for his statistical and historical successes. The historian Pausanias, who provides most of our secure details about the ancient Olympics, calls Leonidas' victories, quote, the most famous of all running records. But he provides no more detail about his life or career. The Roman historian of athletics, Philostratus, does remark how Leonidas' success transformed the ancient people's approach to running different contests. We all know today that sprinting and distance running requires different training and techniques. But Leonidas' victories were for a short sprint, the Stadion, slightly longer sprint, the Dialos, and for a race run with shield and armor, the Hoplito Dromos. I really wish we had a Hoplito Dromos still today in our Olympics. The results on YouTube, look it up, for modern reenactments are especially hilarious. And Leo's dominance changed how coaches of the time viewed these events. As Philostratus notes in his book on gymnastics, quote, no one any longer makes any distinction between the physiques of the contestants for the Hoplito Dromos, the Stadion, and the Dialos, since Leonidas of Rhodes won all three races in four successive Olympiads. Talk about redefining a sport. But that's all that our sources have to tell us about Leonidas, the Rhodian goat. I mean, I just love this image. It's not really him. We don't have images of any of our goats. Oh, well. And now on to our number two goat, Kiniska of Sparta in chariot racing. As we all watch Simone Biles cement herself as the ultimate goat of modern gymnastics, we should take a moment and remember Princess Kaniska of Sparta, the first woman to ever win at the ancient Olympics in 396 BC. The ancient Olympics were famous for heavy restrictions on who could and who could not participate. Only Greeks, only freeborn citizens of a Greek city-state, only men. The ancient Olympics were not open to all. But for every rule, there is always an exception or two to be found. Over time, the rule about Greekness was weakened, with Macedonian kings allowed to participate and eventually Roman citizens, which of course included millions of people in the heyday of the Roman Empire. This is all well-trodden history that shows the relationship between politics and athletics in the ancient world. But women? Unmarried women could compete in a race for the Haraya, a festival held every four years in honor of the goddess Hera, who as Zeus's wife also had a pretty significant temple in the sanctuary at Olympia. This festival, the Haraya, used many of the same sporting facilities, but shortened the racetrack by one-sixth. However, we don't have any more details about these games, nor do we know the names of any winning women. Real patriarchal times these were. According to the historian Pausanias, married women weren't even allowed to watch the Olympic Games, only maidens and the priestess of Demeter Hamina. The city-state of Elis, who managed the Olympic Games, had a law that women caught at the Games would be thrown off the Tepeon cliff, death. But Pausanias also tells us a story about the only women ever caught for breaking this law, probably named Kalipatera, although Pausanias says others also call her Feranica. Either way, she was born into an athletic dynasty from Rhodes. Her father, Diagoras, three of her brothers, a nephew, and her son, Paisirodos, were all Olympic winners in boxing and ultimate fighting. Yes, the ancient Olympics had something sort of similar to ultimate fighting. After Kalipatera was widowed, she decided to dress up as a man and pretend to be her son's boxing trainer in order to watch him compete in the Olympics. Quote, when her son Paisirodos won, Kalipatera jumped over the fence with which the trainers were restrained and exposed herself accidentally. She was thus discovered to be a woman. The officials decided, however, not to kill her out of respect for her family, 
seemingly all of whom wore olive wreaths of victory at Olympia. But they did pass a new law that in the future, the, even the trainers would have to watch the games in the nude. Only a decade or so after this all went down, Kiniska, Princess of Sparta, was the first woman to compete at the Olympic Games. So how did she get around this ban? Well, she probably never married, given that we have no records of it, and she was quite famous. Some a-holes today might have even called her a childless horse lady. But Kaniska was born into wealth, the daughter of the king of Sparta, Archidamos. She was the first woman in ancient Greece to train a team of racehorses, a pastime only available to the uber wealthy. It's kind of like owning a NASCAR team today. It's not something everyone can do. The Olympic winners who won the olive crown for chariot racing were not the charioteers or riders who risked life and limb, but rather the owners of the team. That's how the wealthy Athenian Alcibiades came in first, second, and fourth in the Olympic Games of 416 BC, when he sent seven different chariot teams to compete. In 480 and 472 BC, the four-horse chariot race wasn't won by an individual, but by the city-state of Argos, who had sponsored the winning teams. We will never know if Princess Kaniska was allowed to watch her winning races in 396 and again in 392 BC. Most scholars think not, but it depends on how one interprets the rules for which we don't have quite enough evidence anyway. One thing we do know is that these wins gave her huge bragging rights. While her bronze victory statue was melted down long ago, archaeologists have uncovered the inscribed black marble base. Quote, Kings of Sparta were my fathers and brothers. Kiniska, who won the chariot race with her swift-footed horses, put up the statue. I declare myself the only woman in all of Greece who won this crown. And Kaniska's victory opened the floodgates. Pausanias mentions that many women competed in chariot racing competitions after her, though none were as famous as Kaniska. Although one queen, over a hundred years later, Berenika II of Ptolemaic Egypt, claimed in a victory poem to have, quote, stolen the ancient glory of Kaniska. But despite this boast, Kaniska's glory has not faded. It's her bronze victory statues, which Pausanias mentions were placed front and center in the Temple of Zeus and in the sacred altis at Olympia. It's the pride in her voice which rings in our ears today. I declare myself the only woman in all of Greece who won this crown. A statement for all to see. Kaniska of Sparta was the OG badass bitch of the ancient Olympics. Before we get to our number one goat, a quick note that this channel is dedicated to awesome archaeology and ancient history. My name is Flint Dibble. Hit like, hit subscribe below for more, and share the video with your friends. I've got another Olympics video coming up soon about the time the Olympic judges crowned a dead person as a winner. And now, our number one goat, Milo of Croton, wrestling. No list of the ancient goat of goats could ever forget Milo of Croton, a beast of a man. He is perhaps the only ancient Olympian to still hold major records today against relevant competition. With six total victories at Olympia for wrestling, one in Olympic youth competition and the other five in adult competition across six consecutive Olympic Games. A dominant stretch for over 20 years from 536 to 516 BC. Milo shares this record of wins across six Olympiads with three other people. Canoeist Birgit Fischer-Schmidt of Germany, swordsman Aladar Gerevich of Hungary, and if we trust the earliest Olympic records, wrestler Hipposthenes of Sparta. Milo's record of six wins in wrestling beats out all modern o Olympic wrestling gold medal records. For the modern era, there's a tie with only four golds each shared between Mijain Lopez of Cuba and Kaori Icho of Japan. Some real goats here. But Milo's not just our number one goat for these compelling stats, but also for his swagger. He was a real wild goat the type of celebrity athlete who inspired myths and legends and even a few epic tall tales. 
When war broke out between Croton and the neighboring city-state of Sybaris, Milo led troops, but he wasn't dressed in a soldier's armor, but as Hercules, with a lion's skin and club and an Olympic wreath on his head. It'd be like if Hulk Hogan dressed up as Captain America and led a U.S. SEAL team on an operation. Quick note here, predictably Hercules was a common reference point for ancient muscle athletes. The fighter Polydamus, who won the ultimate fighting crown in 408 BC, went to the slopes of Mount Olympus to hunt a lion with his bare hands, just like Hercules. Theogenes of Thassos, who won once at boxing and another time at ultimate fighting, was proclaimed the son of Hercules. Side note, Theogenes was worshipped after his death as a divine hero. He certainly deserved it, with apparently a record of 1,400 athletic wins in boxing, fighting, and even distance running around the Greek world. A quick side side note, this is the sanctuary of Theogenes at Thassos. I've been there, and it's been excavated and studied by archaeologists. But back to Milo of Croton, our goat of goats. Apparently, when he arrived to compete in his fifth Olympic Games in 520 BC, the judges summoned him to be crowned immediately. No competition needed. Since there were no weight classes, competitors for combat sports could drop out when they saw who they faced. And when you face a beast of a man like this, you quickly tap out. But on his way up to collect the olive crown, Milo supposedly slipped and fell on his back. The crowd shouted that he shouldn't be crowned since he fell down by himself. So he got up, dusted himself off and said, quote, that was not the third fall. I fell once. Let someone throw me the other times. Nobody even tried. Stories of Milo's strength proliferated. He would hold a pomegranate in his hand, quote, so that no one could wrest it away and yet not squeeze it so hard as to bruise it. Only his girlfriend could get it out of his hand. Another trick is that he would stand up on an oiled up discos and make fools of those who would rush at him trying to knock him off of it. But perhaps the most amazing of Milo's feats was when he would tie a cord around his forehead as if it were a ribbon. He then hold his breath, quote, until the veins in his head were filled with blood and then break the cord by the strength of those veins. Gnarly. In one tale, Pausanias says Milo carried and set up his own bronze statue in the sanctuary at Olympia. You know, it probably weighed over a thousand pounds, so about the modern record for a deadlift, but a statue that was carried into a sanctuary and set in place. According to another Roman author named Athenaeus, Milo would typically eat 20 pounds of meat and 20 pounds of bread with each meal and wash it down with the equivalent of 12 bottles of wine. And at Olympia, Milo apparently hoisted an adult bull on his shoulders, not a little calf like this Moscow Forest has, but a bull like these dudes are carrying. And Milo lugged it around the stadium, butchered it, and ate it all in one day. Wade Boggs and his famous cross-country pounding of beers doesn't stand a chance against the wine-guzzling, beef-devouring Milo of Croton. Even in death, Milo was a legend, eaten by wolves. He'd attempted one of his feats of strength to tear apart the stump of a tree. The wolves only ate him because his hand was caught in the stump. I mean, seriously, is there a death more epic for a goat than being eaten by friggin' wolves? So there. All right, we gotta give it up to Running Naked Dude from Miletus. He's definitely the best. But okay, so there you have it. The greatest goats of the ancient Olympics. Tell me who your favorite goat is and be sure to hit like and subscribe below for more good archaeology on YouTube. And please help me improve these videos by chipping me a tip with a super thanks or at ko-fi.com slash flintdibble. Thanks to all my patrons and channel members. Sign up today for behind the scenes content. Later all.